so thanks everyone for joining in. Uh, this is a great pleasure to have uh, Nara and with us today. Uh, and uh, I've kind of given an introduction already, but I'll let him uh, take over. Uh, it's great to have him back. And thanks, Nara. Thank you very much, Naresh. Yeah. Go ahead. So, Go ahead. Um, yeah, so it was about 2005 when all this started, like um, Naresh, uh, I and like other people in um, in ThoughtWorks were all working on different open source tools. And um, we, ThoughtWorks was a great place, as I was saying, you know, to actually have open source. And um, we, when I joined, I wanted to actually like do something in open source. That, that was one of my aims. And um, it had been five years of my programming. I had done one um, startup, failed startup before that. And um, I, I kind of like knew that I could build products, but I hadn't yet figured out how to get an audience for it. So, um, so this was a great platform for me. So when I joined ThoughtWorks, I thought, okay, let me do something here. And one of the f first things that hit me glaringly was um, in in our in our in our team, which was working on a particular uh, web project. Um, the test automation was taking a lot of time, um, and um, it was taking a lot of time because we were using uh, a Silk uh, as as the tool. And nothing, I don't think there was anything wrong with the tool. But the overall thing was, uh, it did it was actually taking a lot of time to do it. Um, it wasn't very great with browsers, especially IE. So, um, and the other newer browsers, in fact. So we we needed an alternative. So then I thought, okay, um, so far before that, I had worked on um, uh, JavaScript parsers, I had worked on proxies, etc. As part of my previous project in another company, of we had done a co-browsing uh, product, and. Because of that knowledge, I thought, you know, hey, I, sh I, I knew a lot about JavaScript at that time. Um, it was the time of um, IE 4 point something and then Netscape, uh, some early versions. So, and I knew the differences between how like someone did like, you know, document.id and like the other one did like, you know, document.all and the other one did not like support that. I knew a lot of those things. So uh, what I thought was, let me actually look at Selenium and see if I can contribute to that. So that was the start of it. and. Um, when I looked at Selenium for our particular project, um, Selenium at that time was a um, was in frames on uh, like you know it would, there would be a top frame and then like underneath uh, you would have your application opening, and the application that we were working on had uh, frame breaking code, which means that you know like you do something like you know um, top dot location is equal to self dot location, which um, kind of blows up the frames and then opens yourself in the top window. Now. When that happens, the the Selenium thing no longer works. So I thought, hey, you know, like this is a perfect place to put in the proxy and the JavaScript injection and make it work. So that was the start of Sahi, and um, uh, I I we had some discussions with the Selenium folks, but you know, given I was in India, they were in Chicago, and like you know, it wasn't so easy to collaborate. And there was an energy that was in me to actually like go ahead and do it myself. So um, Sahi started like that, and. Um, it was it was used in our project it was fairly like you know um, well received. Then uh, it it went up fairly well and on SourceForge like it went up to uh, rank twenty six in like about um, thousand hundred thousands of uh, projects. Um, and then um, and I I kept kept working on it, but there were some things that like you know were very different between Selenium and Sahi. Okay, and um, so different that like you know we took absolutely different paths like you know um, we did a lot of technical decisions which are different from selenium we took a lot of uh, commercial decisions which were different from selenium and uh, today when i look back like you know it, it is an interesting thing to see like where we are both placed um, so this this talk is a little about like you know how how the whole thing happened now um, so let me just bring up a slide um, this is the talk about the tale of two automation tools sahipro and selenium so it's not just sahipro it's, it's the evolution of sahi and sahipro and then selenium so as I said, like we, uh, Sahi is an open source um, test automation tool, web test automation tool. It started out like that. Um, it started in 2005. The principal mechanism of um, automation was to use a proxy to inject JavaScript into the browser. And the JavaScript had full access to the DOM. Uh, so we could actually navigate to the different elements and like figure out, identify different elements. And then we would perform actions. Now, um, the actions were performed using JavaScript events. Um, and uh, this so, so javascript events had an had a good advantage that you know it was inside the browser and uh, if you if you actually did the simulation right for all the um, uh, all the events you could actually do a proper uh, automation thing without needing the browser to be in focus so that was one of the things that happened there okay um 
see a lot of times like the the decisions that we make on like what the technology should be um, for a particular uh, solution is also depend up, dependent upon like what you know at that particular point of time so for me i was good at java i was good at like you know networking uh, proxies etc and i was good at javascript so this kind of like you know lent itself to taking a solution which was based on these things <clears throat> so that is how the solution started off and as it evolved right like um so from 2005 to 2009 i kept working on uh, sahi so it was an open source project it was actually like you know um, I, i was pretty much the um, main contributor to it over the whole time and uh, i kept working on it so as a, as a part time thing so uh, um i had a forum that i had set up like and people would ask questions there i would respond to them and i had a good reputation of being responsive to the um to the end user so it, so it's eventually in 2009 i shifted to the to a commercial version so um i'll talk about like why we did that etc but so far the timeline is something like this in 2005 uh, we launched sahi uh, it had at the, in the first version that we actually took out it had a recorder okay and it had automatic reporting and ant integration so the first release itself like we integrated with cruise control in our project and made it um um work with the uh, continuous integration system so around 2007 we added um ajax was picking up quite a bit so we added um automatic weights uh automatic weights basically the way we did it was to hook into the xhr um, uh, request of http request object um, xml http request object and um, you know uh, listen for callbacks and uh, basically uh, put you know, wrap put a wrapper over it and figure out like when something starts and ends and then based on it uh, go further with the next step in around 2009 uh, we introduced the concepts of near under etc near left off right off etc so the near was the first concept we actually introduced uh, near is a pretty cool concept in which uh, and an element is is um, is identified with respect to something near it okay now <clears throat> why was this actually important one of the main problems of um, you know um, browser or any automation has been to uh, identify elements in a way that it can be rerun every time now user interfaces may have you know um buttons which are which buttons or like you know elements which are meaningful by themselves uh, which could be that okay it's a button like a login button okay so you don't have too many of them you'll have like one or two login buttons and most probably the first login button the second login button are like you know interchangeable so they don't have difference in functionalities so um there is there is no um ambiguity in that so you understand that both of them do the same thing now the other thing that could be there is something that is repetitive for example a checkbox near uh, you know um to select a list of emails okay so if you have a list of emails and you have checkboxes near each one of them the checkboxes like if you were to identify it by themselves like it doesn't have much meaning the meaning comes in when you say that the checkbox is near this particular subject so then it becomes it becomes you know meaningful now the thing is um uh, the user interface uh, which is what we are trying to automate okay the user interface is almost always unambiguous because if you actually have a confusing user interface the end user will not be able to use it so one of the one of the things that happens with the user interfaces is that it it comes out as something that um almost every element is unambiguous or um it it performs the same function without any it is not unique it is the same as the other so this this pretext is actually like this this premise is actually very useful when you're trying to automate um or build an automation tool so you say that okay is it is it is this element significant by itself or is it significant with respect to another so you with in just these two things you can actually like, you know um, make everything automatable so then like in around 2010 we added like regex based identifiers etc where in like you know you identify something with just partial text um so if something was saying hey uh, welcome naresh it would, you can just like identify it as welcome uh, and then um, figure out whether naresh exists there or not so the next like few years around okay so around 2009 2010 uh, is when i launched sahi pro okay why i did it is something that i'll talk about um but we launched sahi pro and um, It, over the next few years we launched uh, we actually added a good editor frameworks in it like a much better reporting um and other things and also like keeping pace with like html5 based developments and there was a lot going on at that time around 2017 like we added windows and java application automation so now we are actually like going ahead or you know um beyond like what 
uh, we are talking about as you know selenium as i say so we went on to become not only just a browser based automation tool but also like do windows automation java automation um mobile automation so in 2018 we added mobile automation to 20 we added sap automation um we added other features like auto healing of uh, scripts intelligent suite analysis um optical character recognition and image based identification etc so uh, what happened over time was you know we realized that just having a browser based solution solves the web uh, part of it but when we were actually selling as a commercial tool in enterprises they had lots of interfaces that they wanted to work with now when they were working with a lot of these so we didn't want them to learn new things to actually be able to automate another technology so as far as like we are concerned it's a user interface is a user interface um you have like and your your inputs are basically the keyboard and the mouse or like you know in time sometimes when you're like swiping okay but apart from that it's pretty much constant that you know you're going to enter text you're going to going to do a few actions and for that like uh we we say that you know as an automation tool everything else is the same it's only the engine that needs to actually change between these technologies and um, so we just build these engines for each one of these technologies to be able to automate all and as a end tester the experience would be the same so they would have a recorder they would have the same kind of like editor etc they can use like you know uh, 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 different like the identifier and you know the object sprite to identify different elements um use the same accessor repository or object repository it's pretty much the same thing except that like they will see a set mode windows or a set mode java in between their scripts that's that's all that changes to them of course the uh, identification mechanisms between these technologies are very different and um, we get into the runtime of each one of these to figure out what is the best equivalent of a dom to actually be able to traverse and find things okay um so th the points of divergence between sahi and selenium <clears throat> um first thing was the philosophy itself and uh, after that like you know there were this object identification event simulation automatic weights um recorders uh, the importance given to coding itself uh, and then like some things about like you know whether uh, the w3c standard uh, uh, web driver became in w3 standard and um, and our our take on like what it was to actually be open source versus commercial and um, commun community was a dedicated support so philosophy itself right so um we were very focused on testers okay so from from the first day itself um the the solution that i wanted for my team at that point was that we were like developers were doing a good job of like it, this is thought works remember like so we we wrote unit tests we did a lot of like uh, you know um, whatever tooling it needed to actually make our code as clean as possible we were um, we, we were pair programming so the, the developer efficiency in testing was in in uh, developing was pretty high okay and also like you know the unit level testing and the deep dive testings they were okay okay but when it came to looking at it from um, uh, from a higher level perspective of the domain of like you know being broad enough to look at the overall thing um developers are not that great at it so um this is you know, as as a developer i know that when i actually am like working on a problem i am going deep down into that code into that particular line of thing to actually make it work and when i'm working on that it is a unit level that i'm concerned concerned about not really you know the overall thing at that point i forget maybe like that is why it came up to that but like at that point i forget and i go deep and it is easy to get lost in the depth and a lot of times the problems happen in the depth and you're like you focus on the depth for a long long time maybe two days three days like a week two weeks so the thing is you need somebody to step back at various points of time to say hey you know what this like in the overall scheme is working not working this is what it should be etc and i feel that for me like that is where testers add value to be able to you know course correct for us to be able to find things in the business domain that like we are unable to actually figure out now oh by the way like this is something that i need to say that you know i am a developer i am not a tester so i like um, and um, uh, it, it is th this the, the reason i actually wrote a testing tool is to make the overall development life cycle faster okay and it doesn't mean development life cycle only means developers but basically everybody involved in software making should like be able to speed it up and make it as like frictionless as possible so that is that is what like you know was the original um, idea behind doing this um and as a, as a developer or like as a team member right i want things to move as fast as fast as possible now um when i look at when i looked at the best testers i knew in my career okay i really appreciated people who would bring out um 
you know some behavior or some like you know some bug which is at the application level which is at the business level that we hadn't thought about because um, developers are good at like you know finding and fixing and debugging and like small small things at the at the low level but like you know at, at the fundamental level is some if something is broken for a business like you know the testers need to bring it on and i have i, I have like immense respect for people like that so to be able to enable them to do automation so for us like it was you know hey automation is like super dumb okay um you already know what you need to do it's only that like you know uh, instead of delegating it to a junior to actually keep doing it again and again you just automate it and it will it will nicely fit in into the um uh, overnight runs also so like you don't need to spend any time or effort in doing that so that is the that is the overall philosophy with which like we built the product so for us anything that actually eases the effort of the tester um be it like you know recorders like automatic reporting um building of frameworks these all we think of it as a tool problem as something that should be part of the uh, test automation tool um so as, when a tester picks it up he we want the best testers who are business testers to be able to pick an automation tool and be able to run with it like from like you know day one now how close are we to it like we are pretty close but the thing is that is that has been our aim now this is fundamentally different from what like you know web driver wanted to become so web driver wants to be a, a browser automation library right so this is fundamentally like you know what we aim to achieve out of these two things okay um so and for us like code is if it it's like saying okay hey um you could write a program to do this mathematical calculation or you could use excel to do that mathematical calculation now um i believe the excel is the equivalent of like our automation tool so like you don't need to write programs to do it you need like something that will abstract out the problem and give it to you in like you know a very easy way of doing it so that's what like we are trying to do okay. so um this i don't know if you want to see it but like um it kind of is a testimonial that you know we had little or no experience with test, test automation so i made it easier to get us started and we were able to see a success very quickly so this like i put in just because you know uh, not many people know of sahi and when i'm talking about it like and given that uh, it is not very popular um do you really believe what i'm saying so this is just to actually you not know, say that hey it is good right um i'll leave this here so okay the other thing that like we were um, you know okay so as a as a test automation tool okay so there are these higher level things of you know okay um uh, frameworks organization of uh, test uh, in execution controllers etc and uh, reporting etc Uh, but at the core like we still need the engine that automates okay and the engine is supposed to do uh, basically two or three things okay the first one is um, a, a reliable way of identifying elements okay um the second one is to be able to uh, um, simulate events and the third one is which which is something like you know you may say it's part of the tool or not but is waiting or synchronization for the right amount of time so if you get these three, three things right it's kind of like you know your automation engine is ready okay um now here um, right from the beginning because like we were good at like javascript i, I was like fairly decent at javascript and i knew that you know um when you the dom is a beautiful way of accessing different elements in the user interface and the dom gives you access to everything that is on the browser okay um so it was it was fairly trivial for me to actually build a library around the dom and say that okay hey identified by the text or identified by the id uh, any significant attribute of a particular element now um right from the start uh, we didn't go with xpaths uh, at that time like css selectors were not even there okay so the reason we didn't go with xpaths was i uh, was fairly you know uh, simple i i have written a lot of web applications even at, by that time and i knew that like the user interface changed a lot um the html structure changed a lot okay now when i have an automation tool that tests the functionality even after i change the html um, structure can the test still run and tell me whether things are working correctly or not that was one of the questions that like you know that tool had to solve now if we used xpaths X, xpaths were basically like you know um, uh, a way of traversing a xml structure okay now the xml structure has like you know xsl uh, sorry um and definition uh, 
I forget what the name is. So you you have these Excel definitions also that are that you can actually verify it against. They they have a fairly rigid format, and you know how to traverse to each one of them in a specific way. And unless the version of that Excel changes, like XML XML changes, you're gonna get to that. Um, you, you will be able to use that XPath correctly every time. But browsers and HTML is not. XML. So um, while it looks like XML, but it is not XML. It is it is a very different way of um, um, it is a rep UI representation, and it will change uh, when your application changes. So using an XPath, which is a rigid way of getting to a particular element, didn't look great to us. Now there are two ways by which XML X XPaths could be used. Um, one is to actually have a full XPath, which is like horrible. Okay. So the the next thing that people do is to actually send it is is, is to do it via um, uh, a regular expression based xpath okay now a regular expression based xpath is like is another added complexity so there is a joke that goes on that you know hey um they wanted to actually uh, build a solution and then they tried to do it with xpaths now they have two problems to actually solve so it's it's the same so um sorry with regexes okay so regular expressions in xpaths is actually um um it you may end up like actually targeting something else instead of like what you're targeting. And it is not trivial to understand. And when it is not trivial to understand it, the likelihood of you actually you know, constantly maintaining it, changing it and like looking at it is lesser likely. Okay. Um, now, so if not expats, what, like, as I said, like, you know, we traverse the dom and this is a question that had been asked uh, before that, you know, um, Hey, if not export, like, how do you actually do it? Well, does a developer ever use an XPath in his application in his in his um, JavaScript code? Never. Developers always use, you know, like you know, uh, the DOM-based way of accessing different elements. And jQuery and all these tools are built as wrappers around the DOM to actually be able to access something much much simpler. Now, um, we we chose to write our own thing because. Um, this was also in, in initial days, people would say, hey, you know what? I can just call the jQuery co um, uh, code to actually uh, do automation, to identify elements. Uh, two things were wrong with like using jQuery. One was jQuery always returned a collection. Okay, so you always like uh, were getting back multiple elements. Okay, you don't need it. You only need the first element. The second thing is, um, what if like the application itself had another version of jQuery that it was using? So we were injecting the JavaScript and like th these jQuery versions would conflict. So we needed something which was our own, which didn't depend on anything else and, and would be able to like, um, you know, uh, solve uh, to identify different elements. The third thing we actually look at is, you know, everything on the, on the user interface, we don't look at it as how it is visible through the implementation or through the code. We look at it as how an end user sees the application. So, for example, in in HTML, if you actually say, uh, um, if you wanted to say like an um, red red ball, okay. So you would say if you put like red space space ball or like you know like a new line a, a new line as in slash and ball or like you know multiple spaces ball, it all is visible to the user to the user as just red space ball. That's it. There is nothing, there's nothing more to it like as the end user sees it. So if you were to actually, you know, um, automate and identify this particular element, we would just use it as like a you know, red ball, okay, red space ball, that's it. So it doesn't matter how it is in the HTML itself, it doesn't matter, okay. Um, so we normalize all white spaces. And this also happens across different browsers. And they treat it differently, actually. Now, um, we, we traverse through the frames and iframes automatically. Okay, and even through shadow DOMs. Now, why do we do that? So if as an end user, if you look at a web application and you see a particular text field, now you do not know as an end user, whether it is in a frame an iframe or in a, um, or inside a shadow DOM element. All you know is there is a text box there. Okay, so we want to keep this simple for the end tester, uh, end user, right? So, if if you use our controller to actually identify an element, it will be like as simple as that. You will just be able to able to identify it as what you see it. Okay. And the third thing we had was you know um, the use of near, in, under, left off, right off, etc. So this is a very powerful concept. Like especially look at a tree structure. Okay, you have these plus and minus icons near all these labels. Now if you wanted to expand a particular folder, let's say, so you would just go to the plus icon near the folder and click on it. So it's a very powerful concept. Sometimes what happens is you have a grid, and this grid is not really a HTML table. It could be something like um, um, 
uh, it divs actually like you know put together as a, as a grid now you want something to the right of so you want a delete button to the right of the username so it should be very easy to say give me the like you know underscore you know, um, button delete near this particular text now this also means that a lot of you know uh, if else conditions for loops etc that you were writing before goes away you you have just one simple way of expressing this particular relation overall okay and also this can be done using the recorder by itself so the recorder will show you how to actually do that so you don't really need to think too much also as to what the relation is how the relation should be picked etc so you just like you know click it, click the anchor on on what you want and then like hover it i may show it if i have time but like let's see and the another concept is like you know of testability so we hear this a lot you know hey uh, developers are writing um, programs that are not testable at all you know these html interfaces like it is it was not testable they don't have ids etc for for us if you have to touch the code for making it a little more testable then there is something fundamentally wrong about your your automation tool so for us like anything that is visible to the user interface and is like you know accessible to the uh, visible in the user interface and accessible to the user is actually like you know testable so because of all these things that we have done right like traversing the dom like looking at different uh, attributes of the element uh, using left of right of in under etc all these makes everything actually testable now of course there are these elements like canvas etc which are not but the rest of the things you shouldn't really have to uh, you know be adding ids or like changing the code or the developer's code to do any of that so the tool the tool should be able to do it that's our philosophy okay so So next comes the event simulation. So we used a fairly you know, um because we were good at JavaScript and we understood how the whole thing worked. Um we built a, a event simulation for each uh, each browser, okay? There there are difference there were a lot of differences. The differences have come down quite drastically now. Um e even now there are differences. So basically what we do is like you know we take an element like we attach um hooks on all the uh, callbacks and all the different um um you know event uh, event event handlers that can be possible so for example on click on mouse or on click on mouse down etc and then um we we take a um, we see what all is happening in what order etc and then we we simulate the events in the same order so this is what we do for all browsers and uh, we have these um, automated scripts which tell us like whether we're doing it correctly or not etc so this works on all browsers mostly so even when a new browser comes in or a firefox variant comes in or like an um, um a new thing comes in um if the browser if you are able to set the proxy on the browser um then most probably sai will work for it, okay um so that has been that had been good uh, for quite some time okay and it's still good um and we kind of like where things couldn't be done via javascript for example file uploads file downloads etc we let the proxy intervene and do that so for example like for file uploads um there are two different ways actually three different ways we do it right now one is to actually do uh, um something to do with uh, uh, data transfer object okay so one one thing was that i don't remember exactly what our implementation is right now the second one was um to be able to use native events for those file uh, file uploads the third one was to actually do, uh, delegate it to the proxy to be able to upload those um, um the content of the file to the end server okay um if those don't work of course we uh, um you know fall back to the os level native events and os level native events are like you know uh, we trigger it through awt java awt or through uh, windows apis so one thing that actually like we struggled with uh, for some time was um normally javascript events were uh, did not need the browser to be in focus so we would actually like you know um we were doing parallel playback on a single machine so we would do like five six browsers or like how much ever the cpu can support that many browsers running in parallel executing scripts and then um uh, once but when when we have to actually like you know resort to the os level events then we we had to have this mechanism of you know locking the other windows like bring that one particular window into focus then do the uh, event simulation and then like uh, resume everything back so uh, right now the product has it but like we i remember that we we had trouble with that so then you, for native events we had to do it sequentially etc so but now it is it is all solved automatic waits this has been something that you know uh, people think is kind of a hard problem to solve it actually isn't okay so sai waits for uh, page loads for frame and iframe loads and for any ajax activity um the tricky part is basically the ajax activity thing but because the other two gives you uh, give you callbacks and um, yeah so 
for ajax activity like what we have done is um, the xml http request object itself we, javascript allows you to actually um, overwrite any object in the dom okay so basically you replace it with your uh, your wrapper object which internally calls the actual object okay and you put in hooks at the start and end and what we do is keep a count of all the xm xx xr requests that are going that are going on and when they have all network activities has subsided which is all all ajax activity has subsided then we go and trigger the step so the way sai works is um when a script executes a step is put for execution in a particular place the browser comes and picks up that step the browser or the windows desktop or the java application or whatever they'll come and pick up that step okay and we'll see whether they are the, whether the application is ready to actually execute that step and before execution it will check whether everything is in a, um uh, every th- the page is loaded etc the things that we're talking about and only after it sees that all of that is done will it actually go ahead and execute that particular step and um, so this gives you you know like you don't have to worry about waiting for things now if it fails even then okay so uh, what sai will do is it will take two seconds and then like retry that particular step and if it fails still like it'll do that like you know for four five times five times actually so this means that when you actually see something really something fails it will take about 10 seconds to fail um and in case like the the system required so there are sometimes some applications which uses which use set timeouts okay uh, set timeouts can actually um they are not in the so if you say set timeout one second and then like your whatever your function is like it'll it'll, it'll trigger after a second and uh, there is no way you can actually know when it is going to happen so of course we could have actually like hooked into the set time out also but for some reason we didn't and like we just like wait for this and and uh, uh, see if everything is fine if things things are fine you go ahead and execute okay. so this all these three things that we talked about right kind of makes sahi's tests are not brittle so um you don't hear that word so much with sahi's sahi's uh, uh, you know automation scripts which actually like has been i i think that there is a misconception that like automation is inherently brittle it is not and all this talk about you know hey um, the the pyramid and like you know you should like write the minimal number of things at the top etc they're all fine but you know the end user is actually interacting with you from the user interface there is a high level of importance to that particular you know small apex like which is the automation test and getting it right and having a you know good suite that can act, that can actually like go through your you know interactions is a valuable thing so um the industry has like you know kind of moved saying that in not moved really like but they kind of like say you know what hey, we'll only do api testing we'll only do unit testing like the the things are brittle it need not be you just like you know um it can be it is a solvable problem it can be solved now um recorders okay another one of those maligned little things which are like super duper awesome um so we have had sec recorder since 2005 and uh, it makes life super easy for the test automation guy okay um in fact for the tester i shouldn't say just automation guy okay so um one thing that recorders do is like you don't need to know everything before you can start doing something it, it gives you a good stepping stone okay and um because like sahi doesn't need weights you don't need to introduce anything So because it doesn't need experts your object identification is already like much easier um there are places where you will need to manually intervene to do the near and in etc but like there are those are like much lesser places and we have ways of actually making it very easy and uh, even simulation you don't have to worry about it too much so uh, if if as a end user if you're clicking it you're clicking it that's it we don't have to see whether you're mouse downing it or mouse upping it like right so like you clicked it you clicked it you that is what you did with the mouse so we just like you know um handle everything internally so because of this the recorder works very very well like you can go like 70 70% of your way with with the recorder now uh, of the way of automating the flow okay not really organizing your code now um as i said like you know good recorders with smart identification they can remove the need for writing code for automation steps they can do it pretty much okay um and uh, sai pro has recorders for browsers desktop mobile and every technology it supports uh, supports okay um even for our api automation like you know you you uh, switch on our uh, network logging in sai you do your um, request responses and you can actually import that request into the api thing uh, into the api testing part to uh, build your test cases for that so recorders we feel are like super important and um because we have worked closely inside the uh, technology inside the you know like runtime of each technology we can get 
really good identification mechanisms, fairly fast, not too slow, and across all these uh, technologies. So there are a couple of um, couple of points that like come up in automation circles. Okay, and that you know, uh, automation code is production code. Okay. we don't below the believe that at all automation is not production code okay um there are a lot of reasons but e- e- any guy like who's actually written good unit tests will know this that you know your code needs to be really really simple you need to be able to like check a particular condition by just modifying that part without like touching everything else so if you are making it complex with like for loops and like you know if conditions etc then like you know you need to write test for the test itself which is like kind of you know stupid like you'll go on doing that um so this is not inception right so um this can have repetition so like in fact like most of the tests are right like they have repetition they they build the, they you know set up the same things again and again they do like you know pretty a lot of things is repeatable except for some changes now why is it okay because it is a test if it fails you'll find out and the thing is if it doesn't fail and like you know if you're looking at it and if you want to actually see if you want to fix something in the in the overall application you need to make that small change not worry about anything else because you have another the whole product to worry about so like you can worry about that but only change this particular test in that particular one line and then go ahead and not worry about all the other tests that it actually touches so it is okay to have repetition in this um and this is very important okay this should be very easily modifiable why do i say that because the more structure and the more like you know um things you know structure that you give to your test the more rigid they get and you your hesit your hesitation to actually change it and to make your application work is going to increase a lot like uh, a lot of you won't touch tests like you know which which have like lots of complexity and you don't know what is going to fail and like you know what happens in automation scripts fail right like there's a whole stigma attached to that so keep it as simple as possible and keep it as light as possible right mm-hmm. and this is like what we did we realized that most most automation tool functionality can be productized so the execution control the test organization the reporting all of this is actually like you know it doesn't change from product to product it sorry it doesn't change from you know uh, your uh, one project to another project your one company to another company they're all standard things and the only changeable thing is your business logic and the and the flow of the application so um you own that part the rest is owned by the tool so that is what like uh, our aim had been now uh, if you look at um, selenium right like it 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 believes that you know hey you have this library okay you do whatever with, you want with it right so basically the i believe that you know uh, the way web driver has evolved is for other layers to pick up web driver and to use it underneath as their engine now web driver gives you the um the freedom to build any kind of tool that you want that that suits you okay and um, while well, like we believe that you know hey just take the whole tool just ho- use it as it is it's very simple like you know it'll you don't need to be an expert to build that particular layer so you can just like go ahead and test your automation uh, you know test your application so this is another thing that is kind of a you know a fud in the overall automation world that the automation and application code language has to be the same um you know hey uh, the testers and the developers write code in the same language and it makes it all easy to actually uh, you know make it work honestly it's it's not it's not at all useful um one of the first premises is like okay so your application was built on php from an old time and then now you want to move to node js let's say now if you are tests were written in php like will you be able to actually run it on the node js thing if you are actually like sharing models and other things in that like then you are kind of like you know messed up you can't do it and the most critical juncture for like where your tool should be you know useful is this is when like you know you are um, when you are actually po- doing such a big port so it is it is kind of very important that you know like you kind you keep these mutually exclusive it is okay if the tester actually like you know um, works in his own silo with his team the point is to actually have enough trust between the two of you to actually say that okay hey you know what i built this uh, is it working not working okay and have communication but the code level you know sharing is not at all necessary it also like makes it very tough you know somebody changes something the tests fail you don't know like whether it failed because of the you know uh, development code or because of your own uh, test code it's just a mess you shouldn't get into it they should be like you know in different i would believe different silos they should like you know work independently of each other as far as the code goes but talk to each other as a team would the other thing is 
um this is like if if as a, if an end user did not need to know your programming language of your application why should the tester know either so the tester is like you know if you're talking about functional testing okay functional testers don't really need to know that mm. and we kind of like you know kept it simple so initially one of the selling points of selenium was that you know you have um, drivers in all different languages okay um we didn't really like you know like we didn't need that so we said okay you know what we'll only do javascript but then like there were other people who were integrating us into their like you know rpa tools or like other tools who needed a java driver so we also have a java driver along with them but overall like we kind of say you know hey which is the simplest language out there javascript just use that okay um okay this is another thing that like i have i have never like figured out why it happened like this so web driver as a w3c standard okay um if browsers really wanted to adhere to standards they would have done it for the html part the js part and the css part the reason there are so many differences is because each one had wanted to be uh, you know have an edge over the other now um, by the way like a lot of innovation has happened because of that ajax came in because of like you know surprisingly internet explorer okay and then like you know uh, google took it with its like gmail interface and like take it to the next level and a lot of things happened because like each one was trying to be better than the other so now um, to actually say that okay they will all adhere to a particular um, uh, standard is it was questionable it, now like it's like you know hey forget like the standard you have only one browser one one you know uh, uh, one browser um, engine now for all of these edge safari everybody has moved to what is like behind chrome so but the thing is our belief was you know you didn't really need a, a, a protocol and we didn't believe that like people would actually do that and an early warning sign was the marionette uh, driver coming out of uh, firefox they wrote their own you know uh, web driver uh, modification of the protocol and did their own thing so it is not easy to actually have something like that so we say that you know hey we will stay aloof of the browser we will actually like you know look at um we will ensure that the customer gets a good automation tool irrespective of how the browser is changing so that is what like our focus had been so um, that is something that i have always question like why is it double three standard okay okay this i think i'm almost out of time um okay so there are just two three two two uh, things that i would say why we moved away from open source um the problem needed a lot of time okay and effort from us to actually keep pace with the technologies browsers were evolving really really fast and uh, you know i couldn't do it part time and um, i liked the problem so i wanted to do it full time so i said okay you know i need to figure out a way of making money out of this um the other thing that happened was like because our tool was focused towards testers we realized that you know they could they could figure out bugs they could find out like you know uh, feature requests that they needed but they couldn't really contribute because like we were targeting people who couldn't really code too much and uh, they wouldn't be able to contribute via code so it was okay so it was good that you know um, um they at least contributed in how they used it right um and the third thing was like you know it was a lot of like you know ego uh, you know ego management that you had to do when you actually pull down contributors they had like different visions you had to actually you know, uh, manage all that and it unless like uh, we were working closely in a team with each other facing each other these things have their own problems um so it didn't really work out so support was like another thing that was really really needed and what happened was like many of our customers had very specific problems of their application or in their environment so they wanted to show like what it was like to actually what that problem was and they wanted to get a you know um, um fixes for that particular problem now we couldn't do it via the open forums and like we had to like figure out like some way of doing it and at some point there were more people wanting support than i could okay so i needed people to actually like sit there and do that um and uh, there are ndas to be signed with a lot of uh, organizations to say that you know okay i saw it but like i'm not talking about it etc so there are these things like you know if you if you uh, when we went commercial we could do all that um so one thing that i found about commercial software was it was true and fair which is like kind of interesting to uh, note because it's involving money right the bad thing but you know it was very simple there was a simple contract if you needed our support and like you know if you like the software you pay for it otherwise you are free to use it uh, you know you are free to not use it and we could concentrate on people who really paid for it we didn't have to worry about like how we were talked about in the, on the internet at all which actually is a big problem in the sense that you know um, people have opinions and um the more popular like something is like the more opinions are in favor of that so you don't really like you know there is not much um 
you don't feel good in that overall atmosphere so you kind of say you no know, hey you know that's all like you know the the overall um Uh, what you call it you know uh, this uh, social messaging or like whatever you do you know th- that that need you don't need to pay any attention to that you know so there is no image to maintain there is no reputation to actually like kind of take care of etc you just like do your work get paid and that's it okay? um we build like we have about like 10 11 uh, uh, programmers who actually work on the product on all these like different uh, lines um we we don't have to we i can set the vision and like you know we can actually work towards that that is like a very powerful thing um and people have time so like 6 months on a project any guy given 6 months to actually work on a problem without any distractions will come out with like ex- excellent stuff the same thing to be able to do part time over like multiple you know months years maybe it could it may work it may not work so you don't know like what 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 you'll get out of it so we could steer that focused innovation because of that we could pay for a customer support team with online meetings like in you know, a 24 hour response time etc and we have stayed bootstrap because like you know we wanted to stay close you know true to the you know, essence of like what we were trying to build and um, that's so if you look at it right the people will say the the framework has courteous support which is quick to provide solutions to arising problems and questions as uh, so i pros maintenance and support efforts are unbeatably low right so and, and if a problem should occur the support is able to solve the problem very quickly now why am i actually bringing this testimonials here because i have been bashed on the internet and like people have said you know hey if only you had a bigger community we would have actually like picked your tool my point is that you don't really need a bigger community you need to solve the problem rightly you know you need to be able to help people in whatever way and if doing it via a closed commercial support actually helps the customer go ahead and do that like it is there is no real you know it's not like in you know, a hey open source like the holy grail and you have to do that only and you can't do anything else nothing right you have to solve the problem right so that's what we chose okay um now the trade offs of going commercial no fame you know this like we um nobody knows about say actually like nobody talks about okay um, but overall right um while it it is it it matters in the in the sales process most of the sales has happened through word of mouth okay now um if it was more popular it would have been nice but you know like honestly like when we were doing that it wasn't the best thing that like you know um it wasn't really what we needed okay um so as i said like word of mouth we, that's how it spread and we can't afford marketing in a lot of places um because we are bootstrapped and uh, as soon as we went commercial conferences expected you to pay because you're a commercial company and honestly like as i say i'm written here you know conference talks scare me so i was okay that you know okay i don't pay i don't talk that's it fine so um our vision to be is to be a good solution you know not necessarily a famous one this like okay all the things i'm saying about fame here right it could be very well a case of sour grapes right so it's <laughs> you're very free to actually like no ignore all of this but you know that's what i'm convincing myself of right now so was was this overall thing a success for me or not yeah as it depends on your personality right like i don't want to engage uh, online argue like argue online i don't want to manage people too much and i'm um don't want to have like you know, any a uh, social positioning etc so it's kind of you know it keeps you it keeps it simple i have my time to do like you know things that like i like my team has like all the freedom to do whatever they want it's it makes it like very simple and clean okay um so to, for us like it feels like it's it's not bad okay um as i say like you know going commercial help me and my customers your mileage may vary okay so that's that's the that's the difference in the in the um overall path that we had taken right so we we um took a lot of like different technical decisions we took a lot of um you know uh, commercial decisions on how we wanted to go um, and that's where we are so if somebody wants to learn sai pro you can they can go to academy.saipro.com i think it will be up in a couple of days now um where we have these tutorials etc and like you know a free uh, license etc for learning um but otherwise like you can uh, these are the things um, yeah so that's it i i think i i overshot by quite some time sorry about that all right awesome narayan thank you so much thank you very much I uh, from the first day I met till now I love your energy your opinionated you know, you know that that's what makes someone uh, what they can do right like it's it's amazing uh, so again appreciate that uh, and appreciate you coming and sharing without any uh, what should i say uh, you know sugar coating things just putting it out right you know that's that's your personality i've known you that way and i appreciate you remaining that way on screen as well uh and you put out things very very nicely in terms of uh, you know what your thought process is 
I I'm looking at the likes uh, here, and it's just amazing. Uh, you know, almost four thousand five hundred likes. Thank you. Uh, that just uh, shows uh, that people do care for authentic, uh, you know, content from you coming directly. And uh, again, you know, I think uh, both these products are great. They have contributed massively to the community and help each other, right? In terms of ideation, in terms of taking it forward. So uh, again, thanks, Narayan, for joining us. I know it was a difficult talk for you personally. Uh, you know, walking this borderline is is very very hard, and you did a fantastic job. So. Thank you again for joining today. Uh, I'm really sorry, folks. Uh, we are out of time, uh, but uh, Narayan is going to be available in his uh, speaker lounge uh, or the VIP speaker room, uh, and uh, you know you can please take the questions over there. Uh, you know, ask more uh, interesting questions to Narayan. Uh, so he will be there. Uh, you know, for I'm hoping for another 60 minutes sure. with us. Uh, uh, you know, and uh, you know, please take your questions there. Uh, now I'd request everyone to uh, jump to the next uh, session, the important announcement sessions, where I want to quickly talk about the slides and videos. People have been asking about that. I have updates on those. Uh, we also want to announce a special contest that we want to run today. Uh, and finally, you know, I uh, just want to get all the volunteers uh, on the stage to acknowledge them. So maybe Narayan, I could also request you to join that, and then maybe be available in your speaker booth so people can join you sure. over there. Uh, so thanks everyone again for joining in. Uh, it was amazing. Uh, we will uh, see you in the next session. Uh, you can click on the stage and uh, join the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you.